Radio Chili Effect is sponsored by WallStreetWindow.com and listeners like you. And now, and now the, most, the most underrated voice in all, in all media, Chuck O'Chelly. January 10, 2024, allegedly, according to that thing we call a calendar. And I thought I was going to trip over it and say 2023 because I got used to saying it. But anyway, here we are live on a Wednesday. And, uh, you know, new move here. Nobody knows about it except me and Larry because uh, Larry Hancock will now be on every other Wednesday. <laughs> so that happens to be today. And that's the way we're going to do this going forward. And I'm happy to do so. Now, um, Larry Hancock is obviously the author of a great many books, taking up a lot of spots on my bookshelf, which I was talking to Larry about just before I went live here. And uh <laughs> it's sort of funny what I was talking to him about. Uh, his books usually don't collect a lot of dust, but, uh, there's dust on the bookshelf and I, I feel like my, uh, my allergies are all worked up over it. <laughs> and anyway, a huge portion of my bookshelf taken up by Larry Hancock. Uh, if you go to larry-hancock.com, you can follow all sorts of stuff, including his blog. Uh, there'll be a link to the WordPress and all that in the show notes. And, you know, a lot of different subjects, a lot of different books I could mention here. Someone would have talked, of course. That's the most obvious one. But Unidentified, I thought of lately because I was watching that uh, <laughs> News Nation special. <laughs> they ran the News Nation specials, first on UAPs, then on the JFK assassination. And uh, other people have been talking to me about special things that have been run about the JFK assassination. I have a feeling we're going to talk about that a little bit tonight. So uh, let's find out. But before we get there, how you doing first, Larry? How are you doing? Tonight? I'm good, Chuck. <laughs> I'm, I'm glad that January is almost halfway through. I, I want to just move right on to March. Sounds good. Let's get to the warm weather. Uh, it, it, it has been cold and damp and rainy here in Georgia even. Uh, really cold for Georgia. So, you know, and uh, again, my voice could be all over the place because of this, the weather changes and the dust and everything else. But again, let's not digress. Um, I want to start off right away with something you mentioned to me in a text just before we went to air, <laughs> because I've been avoiding something on purpose. Um, a lot of people have brought to my attention, and of course, uh, the WEC conference brought to a lot of people's attention, the Rob Reiner efforts, the podcast, uh, the JFK assassination, you know, what do we know after 60 years? All of that. Every streaming service gave us something, sure. But Rob Reiner, famously, right, everybody was paying a lot of attention to the podcast. And he kind of ended it up with a couple of well-known authors in the JFK case. But, uh, man, it's getting weird. And he gave he gave notation to a couple of things that I really wish he didn't. I mean... You know, I like when Hollywood gets involved, but I don't like when they think they've done research. I, I, I got to say, it's <laughs> it's bad. You know, um, anyway, look, I'm, I'm going to keep my comments to myself because I've avoided this podcast for the most part. Um, I guess you've been able to follow most of it or some of it. What, 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 what have you observed about it? Yeah, I've been following the commentary on it. One of the things that shocked people early on, I think in the in the first and second parts of the podcast, I mean, now he's, he's concluded it actually and named the people that, that he sees and given the shooting sequence and everything. But in the very beginning, the first couple of sessions, he talked uh, about giving a lot of attention to Tosh Plumley, mm. who we've discussed before as, as a serious contributor to what he was doing. Um, and that, that threw a lot of people off. And, and I think one of the flags it raised early on, and and you kind of brought this up, Chuck. I, I think it's one of the things that we've come to face is, you know, there are documentaries on the History Channel that are in no way, shape, or form history. Right. You know, there's they'd never get <laughs> there's no peer review, there's no fact checking, they're they're just entertainment. And I think I I talked to Rob briefly at one time, didn't. It seemed to me like he had already had a, a, a very classic view with, of what was going on and, and didn't want to hear a lot more. And I, I think we, we we're facing a problem with JFK in that we're now – the good news, it's moved to the entertainment phase and it gets a lot of attentions and DVDs. and But people are taking it as if it's established history and Rob Reiner – 
is no historian. There is no fact checking and no, no review for his his periods of pot, but got, because he has a name, it's the old it's the old marketing thing. You know, you're presenting something with a spokesperson, and essentially he's acting as a spokesperson for a particular view, and that that's that's one of our problems at the moment in in converting what we've learned over the last you know 50 years into real history is that you know we'd kind of hope that it would slide into a new history direction and we could give a better history than the Warren Commission did right but now it's moved into this entertainment thing so people were worried about that at the very beginning right uh when he introduced Tosh Plumlee and now that he's kind of wrapped it up by naming uh like four or five shooters that are from totally different venues totally unrelated a couple of them very questionable and and he's offering that as the solution which is yeah. essentially brought together like four different tracks through this this milieu that we have been working on separating and now he's lumped it all together again <laughs> see and there, so and there is it's a, a challenge problem. okay here 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 are two problems i want to present to you right and i know i'm not supposed to criticize oliver stone but uh guess what gonna um you know when oliver stone did his work i i always try and forgive it by saying there wasn't a whole lot of information available to fill in certain blanks so some supposition was necessary and that was a hollywood presentation meant to be a singular film so i get it right but ever after we have these different platforms, these different channels, these different entertainment entities one way or another getting involved in documentary and stuff like that. And for a while it was like, well, it's got gravitas because the History Channel ran it. It's got gravitas because ABC did it. And, of course, they're going to push the Warren Commission and so on and so forth. Like there there was this this bit of – I don't know, legitimacy that was placed upon it because it was the great corporate entity that put it out, right? Then we move into a phase where indeed there are people in Hollywood outside of Oliver Stone who are willing to make the statements. And we get happy about that for a minute. But then they do get some technical advisor who obviously doesn't advise them that well. And even when they try to add in legitimate people, they add it into a mix which is a mess. Tosh Plumley is going to bring you a mess. I mean, it's just that simple. All right. Because I mean, th- th- this is the guy that they, they used to back up the James Files thing. This is a guy they used to back up, uh, you know, their shooters on the other side of the knoll, which there is absolutely no proof for. You know what I mean? On the other side of the, uh, excuse me, not on the other side of the knoll, on the other side of the, the of the highway. Okay. Like basically way over toward the other side of the plaza. He's putting shooters in the other part of the woods, okay? Which there's no good reason to think that that exists. <laughs> but his word, right? Uh, he also claimed to have been a witness at one point and seen Kennedy's head go flying way back from the other side of the street, right? Um, his statements alone contradict each other enough. Is this guy trustworthy? Well, you know, if I wanted to find out about some other things that happened a little later in history, I might ask Tosh Plumlee. I might. But I don't know if he'd be reliable because he can't keep his story straight. And I'm sorry. These are my words. These are not Larry Hancock's, okay? But I doubt Larry's going to argue with me too much. Well, no, and and I think with Reiner, I I think there's some responsibility here. I I mean, if you're going to say that you've got the story, I mean – Reiner has some money, you know, he could, he could have had research assistance. He could have gone back and find, found, as I did two decades ago, mm-hmm. that Tosh Plumley has, has had five different versions of his story since he started talking about it. As to where he was, yeah. what he was doing, he was, what he witnessed. And, and to how yes. he, and to how he knew. There was one point in time where Tosh is on record as saying he has all the details about an attack that was planned to occur on Main Street mm-hmm. in Dallas, was that was aborted at the last minute. JFK and RFK were both told. They decided to continue on with the motorcade with Jackie in it. And Tosh claimed to have known all of this because he was briefed by a senior CIA officer 
after the fact, like who flew to, to Florida just to brief him. Mm-hmm. Uh, none of it made any sense. But Reiner should have at least – I mean I guess we have all liked to consider ourselves who have studied this from the first generation on as skeptics, right? right. We, were, we were skeptical of the Warren Commission. So that would imply that we would be skeptical of pretty much anything we would encounter and we would, we would fact check it and, you know, that sort of thing. Well, I would expect Reiner would at least do that much. And in that case, you know, leading with Tosh kind of set a bad example. Mm-hmm. And he just went on to, de- to take different cuts of different views of different people. It's almost like a sampler. My what? impression is that if you looked at everything that we've done in the world of JFK research over the last like four decades, he just it was like a buffet. <laughs> right. And he just picked what was most interesting, you know, oh okay, I'm gonna take one of that and we'll talk about this as well. I'll take another no yeah. That's what it was like rather than any real construct as it were. <laughs> Right. Okay. So, and, and here's where, where the problem is. I mean, I can give you one name off of the list of the five shooters and, and then just ask you to try and put it in context with anything else that's going on here. Uh, you know, he puts Nicoletti on there. Charles Nicoletti. Okay. Um, if you know the story, I'll tell you where his name pops up most prominently is in the James Files story, right? Um, Nicoletti is there most prominently. Now, that's not the only story he pops up in. But that is, you know, and again, this is the mob connection. This is a Chicago mob connection. This is uh, who would have Nicoletti taken orders from? Where was Charles Nicoletti exactly at that time, et cetera, et cetera. A lot of things can be done here to figure out whether he should be in the mix at all. But he doesn't belong in the mix with these other names that <laughs> that are presented at the end. Um Again, like you said, like somebody said, well, I'm going to have tacos and pizza and pasta and some chicken wings. Um, these foods don't normally go together on the same plate. Uh, they don't belong together because they're not usually served at the same restaurant. But again, if you're at a buffet, you know, if you're going to uh, the Golden Corral of JFK, I guess it works. Um, but Nicoletti, how do you put him in context with these other people even? Uh, that, that are listed at the uh, end. So, yeah. Go ahead. As someone has said, you know, who would coordinate this? Even of the names of the shooters, the shooters are so diverse. A couple of them well known and essentially deconstructed over the years. A couple of them not well known at all. A couple, you know, one of them certainly a lot of argument. The, the least you could do is, I mean, if you wanted to do justice to it, you could, you could put them forth and say, okay, Reiner could have done this. You know, this name has been surfaced. Here are the pros and cons. Here's where it came up. Here's why it's supported. Here's why it's not. You know, some balance. Even the History Channel, which we kind of all have come to loathe and say the non-History Channel, at least often has point counterpoint in its shows. But there's nothing like that. There's there's that Rob is offering. Rob, Rob is presenting it, as far as I can picture, as if. You know, I researched this and this is what's true. You know, there's no, there's no point counterpoint. And I think that would apply to Nicoletti. And, and of course, as you say, and as, as people have been bringing up, you know, what he is doing to some extent is introducing a lot of names that most of the more serious researchers thought had already been tossed out. Right. You know, and, which will will definitely muddy the water. I, one of them, uh, Hermanio Diaz Garcia, who I've spent a lot of time with. In reality, the real support for that story, which is totally undocumented, comes from Cuban intelligence. Yes, and it is a figure in a, a book by Fabio Escalante, which was a book really about all sorts of assassination attempts against Fidel Castro. And, you know, not to, not that that part wasn't true, but Diaz-Garcia only arrived in the United States, uh, like, in the spring of 1963. It's hard to connect him to anybody other than to say that he had – he's reputed, according to Escalante, to have been a bodyguard for Traficante – 
in the old Cuba casino days, well, being a bodyguard for Traficante doesn't really put you in bed together with Nicoletti and Giancana. Nope. Uh, you know, how does that even work? You know, and, and we'd spend a lot of time because the name had been tossed around. It, you know, does it make any sense at all? Can we can we connect it in any fashion? And, you know, there's some still some points to be worked on that. But to assert it as if it were proven fact, which is essentially what he's doing, just w- with no point counterpoint, just just bring, brings us back to where we were. It's kind of like he just reset the button back to like 1990. Right. Uh, he doesn't really incorporate anything that we've learned from the work of the ARB, any of, yeah. You know, so it's, it's like this giant reset button and I'm going, Oh geez, didn't we get, didn't we already do that? Um, so that's, that, that's a concern. <laughs> Which is strange because he presents Jeff Morley and Dick Russell in there as well. And both of them, you know, have done excellent work have uh, furthered the research, you know, post-ARRB, uh, both of them, in my mind. I, I would say, you know, Jefferson Moore, <laughs> okay? But uh, but nonetheless, uh, look, you, you, you're talking about two guys that should be well aware that that mixed bag is not... Whoops, I think we lost you, Chuck. Oh, I'm sorry. Can you hear me still? Okay, I'm not sure if Larry can hear me. Um Maybe maybe I'll go to a break real quick because uh, oh no, now you're now you're back oh there he is okay so what what I was saying is that you know Jeff Morley and Dick Russell should be well aware of this mixed bag not being workable because Jeff has definitely done work post A R R B right uh you know and, and Dick I believe has also um they they should be well aware that this this grab bag is not a solid grab bag. Uh, of of contenders here for just this uh, this shooting solution. There's a lot of other problems along the way in the ten episodes too, Larry. Right. I think part of it may be timing too. Just I haven't not I've not really had a chance to talk to to either Dick or Jeff about this, but my impression is that uh, he, he had talked to Dick fairly early on. You know, like some years ago, even maybe more recently with Jeff. But certainly in my conversations with Ref, Jeff, who I talk to fairly routinely, I don't think he's included. I don't think he's in the same space Jeff is now, right. you know. And so that that gets back to the the issue of, you know, because he might have heard something from Dick several years ago. Is that really current thought? It, I, it's hard to say if he's current. And, and, you know, to be fair, you wouldn't want to really blame either one of those fellows if they didn't get a chance to listen to, you know, his podcast or at least to, like I say, do some fact checking with him, right. even even if they'd been his sources, uh, you know, to see if if they have any current concerns. Uh, I'm pretty sure Jeff would be concerned about the Plumlee part, but it as it's it. That, that's where we're, we're facing this. We were congratulating ourselves a few months back, I think, because, oh, well, with the anniversary and now the subject has become more popular in the media, it's, it's getting more coverage and as if that were a good thing. And then suddenly I'm going, well, you know, the old coverage is, it's, it's not public relations. You know, it's, it's not all good. Not, not if you're really looking for some history. Well, see, there's the trouble, right? Is that, okay, I took note of, everybody said to me, well, you should be really pleased because every, you know, I noted every single streaming platform had something out about the assassination. Uh, multiple networks did things about the assassination. That wasn't always true. Uh, and it was interesting, but, I noted every time they were making huge mistakes all over the place. Um, and it wasn't just like, let's make that mistake that's going to only support the Warren Commission. You know, or let's just say, oh, well, the, the government concluded, like like the, a couple of them did not even mention that the House Select Committee had happened, right? Um, some of them would mention other odd things and say, like, uh, you know, the Zapruder film had not been seen. Uh, anywhere at all until, 
uh, you know, it showed up on Geraldo's show. And I'm going, well, these guys don't know the history of things like that, I guess. You know, I, I'm, I'm trying to be forgiving of these different mistakes all over the place. And the truth is, it seems like the fact checkers uh, were working full time on the Warren Commission supporter shows because they got most of their stuff straight. Um, They ignored, they left out a bunch of things. But what they presented was done right. And yet, on the other side, we have something completely different happening. Uh, and, and, you know, when, when you take a look at what Amazon pushed up forward, that was terrible. Uh, what they presented as new stuff and what they then brought back around as old stuff, they brought back around antiquated things that were outdated. And, you know, there was a couple other networks that decided to play the men who killed Kennedy, by the way, over again. Uh, you know, and I'm like, wow, I don't know where. The licenses went for that. I guess History Channel is no longer penalizing anybody for that stuff Um, because there were independent networks doing that, like Newsmax on its cable channel was running, I I think, uh, The Men Who Killed Kennedy. You know what I'm saying? Right, and I I saw the same discussions online about, oh, well, what happened to that one thing that covered Johnson? or Like these are the same discussions I saw 20 years ago, and now we're back having the same discussions. Well, because Uh, in some cases they were rerunning the same crap. Yeah, yeah. exactly. So obviously the the new person, the person who wasn't interested in this 15 years ago now comes around, looks at it and goes, oh, this is new. No, it's not. We saw this in 1999. (laughs) You know, we saw this in 2003. We saw this in, you know what I mean? It's like so between that and then, like I said, Amazon's best big piece there for a second, and thankfully it didn't catch fire really, was, you know, the uh, a body swapping, you know, Kennedy faked his death uh, documentary. Uh, no kidding. One of those. All right. And, and and I'm going, what in the hell is going on here? And then people are telling me, yeah, but this Rob Reiner thing, I'm telling you, it's big. And the WECT conference actually featured the stuff from those people. You know, <laughs> and I'm going, wow. OK, glad I'm not involved with that. Um, well, part, part of what depresses me, I think, is we complained so long and so hard about the Warren Commission. Right. And we 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 praised the people that were the first generation skeptics that found all of the problems with the Warren Commission report, even the, the Warren Commission report. Versus the volumes. Right. You know, and we praise people like Sylvia Meyer, who were like fact checkers and showing inconsistencies. And so so for years and years and years, we have panned and cursed and whatever the Warren Commission for doing things that we're not doing now. Like, OK, where did all the skeptics go for the conspiracy stuff where we're, uh, we raised all sorts of issues like, well, this is inconsistent with that. And how do you connect these dots? And where's this change? And, and we slam the Warren Commission and the Dallas police and everybody all the time for doing that. But we don't do it to our own stuff. Right. And that's a problem. Um, you know, we, we can't, we can't, it's, it's certainly not even handed. You know, if there, there are two views in play here, you ought to be on the same playing field for both. You can't criticize them and then not apply any of those same standards to what we're generating out of the conspiracy community. Right. I, I, that's the thing is that, that now there's no standard and the idea that you don't just automatically agree with anything that is other than the official conclusion is a problem. You know, and this is, again, the same thing that I was complaining about for years on this show is exactly this. <laughs> And it got worse. It didn't get any better. You know, Larry, I'm sorry. I, I guess I had no effect. Um, I, I really wanted to have an effect on this and say, look, why don't we begin to police this stuff on our side and say, you know, uh, look, there, there's got to be some level of uh, r- realistic judgment on this. There's got to be some way to peer review these things among people who know the facts to say, look, you know, this is sort of a ridiculous thing. And all of this stuff just continues to permeate and just gains popularity like it's a meme online. Uh, it's just if people like it, great. They'll share it. It'll go viral. That's all there is to it now. 
You know, there, there's no yeah. like, it's not because the facts fit. It's not because it answers questions. It's not because it adequately, you know, uh, uh, explains all of the oddities. It's not, none of that is there. Um, <laughs> and, and it's just, it's really kind of depressing because that's the stuff that personally I used to be very impressed with where it was like, look, can you explain the oddities? Uh, you know, very, very much like with the, uh, uh the different circumstances. I, I don't know. It's like you're supposed to just accept things because they are of the conspiracy side of the equation, you know, and whatever and it is you can The more get. mysterious they are, the better. I, again, it's, it's sort of like the more mysterious, the more, oh, we don't have answers. That makes it credible. Yeah. Uh, and we're kind of playing that game. Like, well, it could be anything. One of the, you and I've discussed one of the things that that continues to bug me is if you throw out everything, right? Like I can't accept anything from the police. I can't accept anything from the FBI. I can't accept any witness, and I can't accept any accept anybody that says anything about Lee Oswald that I really don't like. That doesn't make him look like innocent. Whatever. If I just automatically throw out all that, I have no data. And one of the things that strikes me is like, well, one of the places we end up with is we do so much. It's speculative because it has to be speculative because you threw out everything like that means I can make up my own story. Well, believe, um, believe it or not, I because want to simplify. I don't, there yeah. are no facts to hold me respond. <laughs> you know, it, it's easier that way. <laughs> well, see, yeah, believe it or not, I want to simplify this, though, a little bit for the listener, because th- this is a huge, huge problem where, OK. You start discussing documents with somebody. Eventually, you'll find an argument. Well, all the documents are, you know, obviously they destroyed everything that they didn't want you to see. So those documents aren't legitimate. Okay. (laughs) Then you say, well, you know, based on the different parts of the investigation that were conducted, we know this, we know that. Well, the cops all lied. Okay, uh, fine. The cops all lied. Well, what about the FBI reports? And then they go, well, the FBI is obviously covering it up, so they're lying. And you go, okay, what about the film? Well, the films have all been tampered with. So none of those are reliable. And at the end of it, one by one, every single area I wind up going through, I go, all right, so tell me, what is it that you think is legitimate? (laughs) Okay, what is legitimate? That is publicly accessible, that is in evidence. Okay. Not, not, not your ideas, not your speculation, not your, you know, theory. But in all honesty, what is a legitimate piece of evidence? Let us begin there. And you know what? There's a lot of people out there that don't have an idea about what could be a legitimate piece of evidence. It's all illegitimate. In other words, everything is faked. Everybody's lying. Nobody's telling you the truth for all different reasons. And so what are you left with? You, you know, at the end of it, I throw up my hands and go, well, then there is nothing for me to discuss with you. <laughs> because what am I supposed to do? I'll make, an, I'll make an observation, that two observations, one of which will make people mad. I will say as an author, yeah. you can write a lot more quickly that way because you don't need footnotes or endnotes or, or source. It just You can just go, okay? You yeah. can just go. Um, and it, it's, it'd be a lot faster. The other thing is, It's also a lot easier to engage in social media, forums, whatever that way, because you're not handicapped, again, by sources. Now, I keep telling everyone the reason I can't really engage meaningful and online is the conversations we get into can't be carried out with like three posts of 20 words each. They're, they're, you know, you want to give me six hours and let me set two hours of contact or before we even talk? Then we can get serious. But if you're not right. bound by any, if you're not bound by any data, then you can just go at it. You know, I believe this. I believe that. I believe this. I don't trust that. It's all you. Right. <laughs> so it goes much more quickly. Yeah. No. And the other problem here is that, and, and now, now here's the thing. I just threw out all that different evidence, right? And I said, okay, forget it. You can't listen to the photographs. You can't listen to the recordings. You can't go with the timelines. Okay, fine. All that stuff you toss aside, what is it that people will accept? Well, they do accept testimony on one level or another, right? Somebody's story. This person said this, and I believe that person because they should have been in the know. That's usually where you get to when they think all the evidence is faked, right? 
now there's problems with that because every time I turn around, okay, you got you got people like Tosh Plumley. I mean, you know, pick one end of the pool or the other. What he said. You got others, uh, you know, like uh, uh, Frank Sturgis, let's say. All right. <laughs> let's just bring up another name that'll confuse people. Frank Sturgis uh, might have told you different stories at different times. Allegedly, he said something to some cop. But wait a minute. You don't usually trust the cops. Yeah, but I trust that cop. OK. Um, Larry. <laughs> and then you have the stories. And this is the thing that you brought. Again, I keep pointing this out because I was really moved by this when it, when I heard you say it, you know. And I was waiting for, like, noise from the back of the room, from, you know, gasps from people that I know absolutely relied on the kind of thing that you said. <laughs> you're you're being ridiculous if you're relying on a guy who's, like, 90 years old to now tell you his new story, uh, even though he's already told the story 50 times, other times, over 50 years since you discovered him. You know, now he's 90 and tells you a story. Now you accept it. Not a good way to go. <laughs> not reliable testimony 50 years later. I Wit mean, witnesses do not age well. They don't. Like milk is only good for three weeks. <laughs> witnesses are not good for 60 years. <laughs> no, they're not. What is? Can you, you know, can you accept anything that is, you know, I mean, seriously. It's and, I, and I think we can, but one of the, the other thing, and I think this is to get back to Reiner, I think this is a, a perfect case. If, if you're going to get that amount of airtime yes. and that amount of face time, mm -hmm. you have a responsibility and you have a responsibility to check your sources. You really do. You have a responsibility to see the other side. I mean, if we if we're going to hold the Warren Commission's feet to the fire, then, OK, we ought to hold ourselves to the fire. I'll give you an example that just came up this last week. OK, someone made a post again about Dr. Berkeley moving President Kennedy's body out of Dallas, you know, and I made a post back about something Berkeley had said about, well, you know, it was clear at the time, you know, there was no there there was no criminal investigation. The police were not involved when when they were taking the body away. Berkeley said, you know, the only way a legal postmortem would have been available at that point in time was for the family to sign the paperwork to do it or for a court to order the autopsy. Okay. Now we know that that did happen in DC right. when the Kennedy family ordered it, but that's not happening in Dallas. Jackie is um, traumatized. And someone came back to me and, and, and posted something. And this, this struck me. It's kind of like, wow, man, I have missed this and we have all missed this. They said, well, what about that phone call from Air Force One ordering from Johnson personally ordering the body to be taken Back to Washington, D.C. And I said, well, uh, where'd that come from? I've never heard anybody say that. It's never been. We've argued this point for decades now before I was being argued before I came along. Yes. I said, well, somebody just posted that back in 1975, a book was written that says Jack Valenti said he was sitting by Lyndon Johnson on Air Force One and he heard him make a call to somebody. He didn't know who. Now, we don't, since we don't know who, we don't know where it, where, but anyway, the inference was it was Johnson that made the call to tell the Secret Service to bring that guy, guns blazing, if necessary, take the body. I said, well, okay, I, that's, that's pretty fascinating. Are you going to research that? Can, can we fir can confirm that? You know, when did Valenti say it occurred? Was Johnson on the plane at that time? Was Jackie in the body? And who's going to do the legwork to see if that's even possible? Right. And what you heard was a big resounding nobody. It's like, okay, you can't just posit that out of nowhere and explain a mystery and let it lie because somebody wrote it in a book in 1975, for Lord's sake. Well, and sadly, uh, you could start Maybe it's with, true, but – Yeah, maybe it is do true, Do the but, homework. Yeah, you got to do the homework, and you could start with – look, there was media coverage of the body leaving the hospital. There's media coverage of Johnson leaving the hospital. That gives you a clock, okay? It shows you when the body left. It shows you when Johnson left, Okay. Pretty simple, and right? Man Manchester has a very detailed chronology in his book, and and we have a very detailed chronology of what Johnson was doing 
when he got on the aircraft. Yes. I mean, wh- what we what we've heard from people that were there is that he didn't settle down by a phone. I mean, he just was running up and down the aisle looking at TV monitors and doing that. You know, so when could it be? that Valenti would have sat down beside him to hear him on the phone. It's not on the Air Force One tape. All of Johnson's calls that we know. So that's another thing. It's kind of like if we accept that, that means somebody scrubbed that off the Air Force One tape. But they didn't even scrub off this exchange with RFK, right? Or, which Johnson lies about. They didn't scrub that, but they scrubbed this. You know, so especially since it's not on the tape, you've got to prove it in. I, I think it would be great if you could prove it and – Get one more mystery out of the way, but nobody's doing that kind of homework now. Right. Uh, because it's just easier to say, oh, you know, that's the answer. Well, I don't know that that's the answer. See, but they Reiner's just, doing yeah. essentially the same thing, saying, I got all the answers. Yeah, but that's, uh, and well, that's okay, the, Rob. And, um, and that's the crazy know. thing is Valenti would be a guy who is in the know. But yeah. it doesn't mean that he accurately related the story. OK, it just doesn't. I'm sorry. So you better, you know, back that up. You better come with some verification. Right. You better come with corroboration regarding this. As you said, Manchester's got a great chronology. But also, again, you can study the media that day. You can get a clock as to when the body left. You can get a clock as to when Johnson had departed. OK, you can do all that and then try and put this together. Because to my knowledge, I, I don't think there would have been a lot of time where he's telling them he's at, he's already on the plane and telling the hospital to go get it. I mean, from in my mind, maybe I'm remembering this wrong. Yeah. But I don't think there would have been there would have been time to do that. <laughs> I, I you can one of the things that you can do from the the Air Force One tape mm-hmm. is you can see exactly when Johnson started making telephone calls. Right. Because one of the things that we know from the Secret Service agents on the plane was that when Johnson first got on the plane, he didn't really even – somebody had to tell him there was a telephone available. Because right. uh, in those days, let's face it, uh, you didn't get on a plane and use a telephone. That would work on Air Force One. It would not work on a normal airplane in 1963. You know, So somebody had to make him aware he could even start making telephone calls. Right. There was – the phone was back in the private – presidential area so valenti would have to be back there um so it it could be checked and i think that would be great but it it's just again if we're going to hold ourselves to the same standards that we hold the warren commission into you you need to you need to check it out before you assert it as fact right right and, and and meanwhile, I, I'm thinking that Johnson could not make a direct order to the Secret Service. He'd have to get the head of the Secret Service who was back in Washington to issue the order yeah. to the Secret Service. So this means there has to be communication here uh, in, in order for that order to get transmitted from Johnson. It, it's just – look, there's just a lot of problems here, and that doesn't happen in a matter of seconds. It still didn't happen in a matter of seconds even with the best technological setup at that point in time. Um. Anyway, and this is me speculating about it and trying to say these are the questions I would need to answer in order to satisfactorily say that's the way it went down. Uh, maybe I'm so, crazy. So it, just, you know? it gets back to it. If you're offering alternative history, right. which is what all of us really – you know, we would we would like to offer an alternative to the official story, right? Right. Well, that means that your history, you know, it has to be treated as if it were history. You've got to be open about what you know, what you don't know. Uh, it was we talked about this before a little bit. I think it was was fascinating when when we see that uh, you know even even on the Warren Commission staff uh, there were memos written that said. We can't say this. You know, Liebler writes a memo that says here are 30 things that we can't say in the report because we really don't know for sure. And you're saying this as if it was positively true. Right. You know, and he writes that memo and nobody wants to read it. Right. So at least there was some some internal level of consciousness from the commissioners themselves. You know, at least at least they had some level of. Well, you know, and in, in the end, of course, they decided to waive all that. Well, bad on them, but we don't want to be the same way. 
Well, that's the other thing here is for all the complaining anybody can do about the official story, you're doing a worse job of it by accepting all this nonsense that contradicts itself. And that's the other problem is just the logic of it contradicting. Okay, how could you put those five people together like you said, right? I mean, it's it's not even comprehensible, uh, comprehensible in my mind to assemble these people. You know what I mean? And they're shooting in a coordinated fashion. By, by the way, you just – you can't have them. They have got to function as a tactical paramilitary team in the six seconds, right? Yeah. I mean, I mean, you don't just – like Plumley, you just don't send five people to the plaza and they end up shooting at the same – over the same six seconds of time from five different locations, no less, yeah. you know? How does that work? How does that work, Rob? Tell me, brings bring a military person into this dialogue and tell me what has to be done to make that work. Don't don't just assert it. Yeah, uh, I mean, because look, if you leave it open to just open speculation, right? Somebody could say, well, look, if you dispatched uh, n- whatever number of shooters you wanted and gave them all the same signal, and they were all supposed to shoot at the same time. Right. The, 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 this is this is a way to go at it. And then and then they all did. And some of them didn't. Maybe. OK, that's great and all. But, <laughs> you know, I could also assume that there were 100 guns there and only three of them fired. You know, I, I, we, we, we could go through many different assumptions that are wide open. Right. <laughs> well, and somebody pointed out and you did that so you could blame it all on one guy. Yeah, there, there's five a problem. people had them all shoot simultaneously, and your plan was to blame it on one guy. Yeah, if nobody gets uh, caught, okay. we'll blame it on this one guy. Tell okay. us how that worked too. <laughs> if nobody gets caught, uh, mind you, five people got the got, escaped as well, right? I mean, you know, Nicoletti, given Nicoletti's age, and you know, it's kind of like saying, I mean, I'm surprised he didn't name Roselli, but I mean, you want to take all these old guys who can not move all that well anyway and have them score good shots when they haven't fired a rifle for ages and then have them get away, yeah. right, because they're trained in how to do that. Um, sure. I mean, I remember talking to a guy who knew Nicoletti at one point and, and him laughing at the idea that Nicoletti would use a rifle even, you know. <laughs> like, <laughs> like, Yeah, the same with Roselli. We talked to some people who knew Roselli and knew at that, at that point in time, and they're going, no, you got to be kidding. It's yeah. just – it's laughable. So so anyway, I, and I don't – I was going to say I don't want to be too critical, but on the other hand, yes, I do. Because if you're going to offer offer something that – not just me, but generations of people have been working on to find the right story – Right. You need to have a little responsibility to all of them to make it as right as you can make it so people don't laugh at it uh, or or people believe it and then then it gets deconstructed. And I, I, I had somebody call me up. Actually, I had a couple people call me up after the special with the Dallas doctors was on. Yes. And they, they knew nothing about this subject. And they were all excited about what they had heard, and it's like, well, okay, you know, tell me what you got out of that. And they said, well, what I got of that out of that was every single doctor at Parkland knew immediately after the assassination when they'd seen the body that the president had been shot from the front. Hmm. Well, not quite that simple. You know, so, again, we're at the point now of, we we blame the mass media, right, for right. crafting the Warren Commission story right. and the CIA for issuing a, an internal memorandum that says, OK, everybody, you've got to help us defend the official story. Right. Now we're crafting the unofficial story. <laughs> anyway, it, it doesn't feel good. Yeah. And the unwritten memo is now, look, you got to support everything that supports conspiracy. Otherwise, you're a bad guy. I mean, really, that's what it comes down to. Uh, and if you question even some of these things, it's the weirdest thing. I'm telling you, I and I had this experience with the Judy Baker thing still, still, which, by the way, he had a, a kind of a tacit endorsement of her, I think, earlier on in his podcast, from what I understand. Yeah. Uh, you know, where it's like, well, and she says and it's like. Really? 
he, taking, he didn't really leave much out. No, he didn't. Uh, I mean, I don't think he did the driver shot him. I don't think he did that. But other than Good that, point. <laughs> you know, he, I guess it could have been worse. It could have been worse. Uh, but at the end of the day, he leaves us with a grab bag of easily beaten down. If somebody uses logic, you know, again, uh, as much as I can't stand Gerald Posner, one thing is he at least sticks to a logical story. Uh, <laughs> you know, I'm just, I well, hate to it say makes, that. It makes it difficult for the rest to follow on behind. You know, how, if, if I was to go out and, and talk to everybody that Rob had viewed that series and say, well, it's not, here's, here's the problem and maybe it wasn't quite, you know, they would look at me like, well, what could you possibly know? The, he, you know, uh, it, because he has the, that will have the kind of reach that it has and, and the kind of mind share that it has. It's going to be very hard to back away from it. People will think that they now know. Uh, and if you disagree, as you said, suddenly you're, you know, <laughs> we're kind of like, okay, if, if we disagreed with the Warren Commission, we were idiots. Now, if we disagree with this scenario, we're idiots. We just can't get out of that. Yeah, one way or another, you're gonna you're gonna be uh, branded as an idiot because you you have objected to the wrong thing. Uh, what 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 can you do when you're looking for I don't know uh, an actual solution? You know, uh, a a reasonable, plausible explanation of the history here, given the facts, given the evidence that exists. Uh, and again, if you're going to throw out all the evidence and, and I have this problem all the time where, you know, again, I'll begin explaining something and they just find a way to throw out that evidence. You know, you can't trust the cops. OK, you can't trust the documents. OK, you can't trust the films. OK, you can't trust any of the medical evidence. OK, where, where do you want me to go? You can't trust what Lee Oswald said either. Oh, OK. Yeah. Right. Not even all the right. stuff that he said himself. You know, uh, regardless, right? And and I'm not going to delve into that too much, but I mean, it, it it bothers me a little bit with the prayer man thing because guy says he was not out, he was in the building at the time, but anyway, he said it publicly. Um, okay, <laughs> you know, ugh, all right. Uh, which, but I think, in all honesty, we have to admit yeah. there are ways to deal with this. I mean, historians yes. have to deal with this stuff all the time. Law enforcement has to deal with this stuff. People say different things at different times. People lie. You you have yes. confusion in the facts, and you have to approach it in a practical manner. It's not that it can't be done. Right. It, there's context. There's situational. Lee Oswald lied at times. Yeah, sure he did. Can we get a handle on when he lied and when he didn't lie? Yeah, sure we can. So we don't have to throw it all away. Right. Um, it, it, and I guess that's another thing that strikes me. This is like real world. This kind of chaotic situation occurs in in most crimes, many crimes, right. uh, certainly many violent crimes, and people deal with it. You know, the system deals with it. Uh, so it's not like there aren't best practices and approaches and so on and so forth. It, it, Certainly, we wouldn't be in the place that we are now if this had gone to court and there had been a defense attorney and we would have tossed all of this stuff out before it ever got past 1964. Right. You know, the, the fact that it was all accepted in the evidence essentially by the Warren Commission was a problem, just like we've talked about it. Same thing happened with MLK and RFK. You know, the system failed. Right. Because Oswald had no defense, but I, I think it's fascinating that uh, looking into it a little bit more, the the fellow that Warren, uh, the fellow that was supposed to look out for Lee Harvey Oswald from the Justice Department, uh, never did anything essentially except write a memo that say you guys actually shouldn't make a case that Lee Oswald could shoot well. Because that's going to be hard to support. That's the only thing he contributed. But I'm sorry to rant on that. But there are practices that allow you to deal with it at least openly and transparently and even even handedly without just making you know assertions. 
Right. So, look, at the end of the day, I guess, uh, with, without continuing to beat the dead horse, what we got to do is say that there is a lot of work, <laughs> you know, and I'm not saying you are, Larry. I mean, I am. I know I am because I'm frustrated. Uh, you know, at, at the end of the day, there's a lot of work still to be done. And I think there is a way to do what happens in most criminal cases. Like you said, yeah, the chaos factor happens, right? People lie. People are covering things up. People deny stuff at first until they're caught, et cetera. But see, nobody ever got caught up in their BS at the time. And we didn't go through that process at the time. So what you have is instead of this contracting universe of possibilities and this contracting universe of evidence that normally occurs in a murder case. Uh, you don't have that here because it never got to that point that would have condensed it. It never got to that point in the system where somebody had to challenge this stuff, where you actually had to have a standard by which you entered these things into evidence, right? In a court. And that's one way of doing it. There's, there's more than one way. But, I mean, one standard one could use is what could you actually enter into evidence in a court, right? Um, and what would be stronger evidence? What would be a more persuasive evidence? What would weigh a great deal more? What could be corroborated directly? What could be maybe possibly true but not corroborated, uh, et cetera, et cetera? And what might have changed had there been pressures on people if there was not a need to testify, you know, with the Warren Commission, but it need to testify in a courtroom. It would have been a different circumstance. So we don't end up with the contracting universe of explanations and evidence. We end up with an expanding one. And unfortunately, it, it has continued to expand now for more than half a century. Um, you know, look, I'll, I'll, I'll give the first few years to the people needing to take time to do the work and the research, right? And say, let's just give the first decade away to the Warren Commission and just the early critics. After that, the universe continues to expand because people started to dig into things more and dig in on their positions more. And therefore, the universe really started to expand after that first decade, right? So this is what we've dealt with for now a half a century. And how does it get better? Well, there's still a lot of work to be done. I think there is a responsible way to handle this, but I, I just, I don't know how to come up with a consensus on it. How do you convince, uh, now this whole new group of people? Because a bunch of people have written to me about this Rob Reiner thing, like, oh, this is so great. They're thrilled because it is a recognizable name. It is somebody with a large platform who is legitimately advocating for something other than the Warren Commission solution. But on the other hand, did he do us any favors? You know, like I, I get the Oliver Stone thing and people complain about that still. And, oh, Stone entered a whole bunch of things into his movie that really don't make sense. If you put them together, was it the mob? Was it this? Was it that? But Oliver Stone was making a movie. He wasn't telling you that that was the absolute yeah. facts. Even he said it was a counter myth. And a counter myth could be this way. Yes. But these podcasts where you're telling people you have solutions. These podcasts where you're telling people you have actual information is different than that Hollywood movie, that work of historical fiction that Stone used and utilized in order to get a result, which got us a lot more documentation, got us a lot more research, got us a lot more of a lot of things. But I don't know if we're going to be able to do ourselves any favors moving forward. I mean, is there a way to start making the universe contract as opposed to expanding. I mean, do you have any ideas about that? And I'll close this discussion with you on that. Is well, Do you have any ideas I, about going forward? What can we do? I, I think this? perhaps the, the positive spin is that, that you could get all of it is, is that more history books would be written or more, you know, more would be written where Oswald is simply characterized as the suspected assassin. Mm -hmm. Or there, there's some comment about it being in dispute, uh, you know, not not asserting it as absolute 100 fact as the way the Warren Commission did and as the way that the history books were for a time. Maybe maybe we will get to the point where we can claim that much as a victory. Um, I think the other part of what can happen is uh, it does have to age to the point where there are history books written on it. I, I will say there are history books being written now on the Korean War right. 
or on aspects of World War II uh, or the Lincoln assassination, for heaven's sakes, that are actually much more factual and much more accurate than anything that was written in the years following the incident. You know, I, as an example, right now, if you were a good historian, you could not write about the Vietnam War without writing to the extent that the Russians actually had troops inside Vietnam. Uh, same thing goes for Korea. That would have been verboten in the first years after those wars. So maybe the point is that, that we can generate enough hard data so that in another, you know, a hundred years later, historians can treat it from a distance and treat it far more objectively than we could up to this point in time. I think we just, we have to generate the data. We have to put it out in some format where a historian would trust it, you know, where they can see that it's cited and sourced and we just didn't make it up, you know, so that that's a problem with books these days, even with the way that, Publisher do, are doing books where, where they're consolidating sources page by page, and you can't tell where any particular commentary came from as far as the source. Right. Um, I don't know. I, I guess the answer to me is it's almost as if you need more history students writing real history papers on the assassination. Uh, you need more – you need less entertainment and more history, and that maybe is just my personal point. But you can't you can't overwhelm the entertainment. We can't overwhelm. Right? He'll he'll create a general impression. All we can do is collect and put together stuff that a historian may find useful when when it gets to the point where you can tell the real story. Right. Um, we're closer than we were forty years ago, thirty years ago. Yeah. Um, you know, well, but at least the challenge it's is still seen somewhat as well, of yeah. a taboo. Right. It, it, quite frankly, it's still sort of a taboo subject for real historians, possibly because what we just talked about. They'll look at what they see on, you know, they're human too. They'll look at what they see on TV and they'll go, "Oh, geez, I, I can't, you know, I can't do a paper on that kind of stuff." Right. Right. Well, you know, and the good thing is, I guess, uh, again, we got to take the positive spin is that at least the the idea that this can be challenged is viewed as legitimate. Now, what it is that is used to challenge the official story is yet another question. Uh, and like you said, I guess it'll just have to be up to the data and eventually it'll all shake out and we'll hope that it shakes out to a point where, you know, there is well, a most likely story that could be told. That There's doesn't... another positive point Chuck, that I just I don't want to yeah. overstep, but Go ahead. one of the, the things that the first and second generation, when they wrote something, right. there was no way for the reader to verify it. It's totally critical now. The body of information that is built, built on the Mary, Mary Farrell Foundation, right. the Black Vault, getting all of this actual that, – that's why we can't throw away the documents. Right. If you say – I'm throwing away all the documents and all the witness testimony. The historian 50 years from now will say, oh, I'll go write about something else. You know, if you guys say this is all fake. But the good news is we've collected that. A lot of people have spent tons of work collecting that body of information. So you can write – someone could write a good historical paper on how the Warren Commission screwed up, you know, and and quote real sources and real documents. So – I don't want to be too depressed because we've done that much to enable real histories. Mm. Exactly. Exactly. All right. Well, Larry Hancock, I just want to uh, thank you for walking through this with me again. Go to Larry-Hancock.com. Uh, I, I recommend all of Larry's writing, <laughs> but, uh, but you know, th this is a necessary thing. And this conversation is going to have to be continued because Look, it's not just Rob Reiner and it's not just what will be put out, you know, by people that have major reach and all this at this point in time. Um, I think there is still this continuing need to police this to begin to come up with a reliable contradiction to the official story that is 
not based on wild speculation and grab bags of things thrown together. I mean, that's really what it comes down to. We've got to eliminate that stuff. We've got to eliminate it from legitimate, you know, consideration. Is the general public going to consider many different things? I guess so. We don't have a choice about that. But uh, but we do have a choice about what it is we choose to present and what it is we choose to uh, lend credence to as we go forward. So that's the way I'll leave it with you guys for tonight. And uh, remember this, I'm merely Ocelli, and all of you are indeed the effect. Remember, go to Larry-Hancock.com, and I'll also give you the link to his blog in the show notes. And uh, we'll talk to Larry in two weeks. Take care, everybody. WallStreetWindow.com Gold, silver, the stock market. WallStreetWindow.com Perhaps you're invested deeply. Perhaps you're not in deep enough. Maybe you're thinking about getting started. WallStreetWindow.com Michael Swanson, the brilliant author of The War State, understood these trends professionally for many years, and now he gives you the benefit of his knowledge. WallStreetWindow.com Go there now. Go there now. Go there now. Go Go ahead, caller. Hey, I'm interested in the truth about the JFA assassination. Right. Well, what do you want to know? Judy Baker's wild claim. Oswald girlfriend. He knew Ruby and Barry. Cancer weapons. Really? I imagine I could claim I have four wheels. It doesn't make me a wagon, but okay. Oswald was on the kill team and trying to prevent the murder of John Kennedy. Come on now. Has a real effort on the JFA assassination built into her claim? Go to Amazon.com. Enter Judith Baker in her own words. You'll get the results for a digital copy of a book where Walt Brown utilizes her own words and the known evidence in the case to get at, well, <laughs> a different perspective, let's say. You can get Judith Barry Baker in her own words from the author himself, signed if you request it, by contacting Dr. Brown at K-I-A-S-J-F-K at AOL.com. It's a fun book and it actually dissects the many, many fantastic claims. Judith Barry Baker in her own words. Thank you for all the great information. Views expressed by callers Schools or anyone else who happens to get on the air at Ocelli.com do not necessarily reflect the views of Ocelli.com or Chuck Ocelli, and we are not responsible for any stupidity which might ensue. Thank you. Do you like history, real history, that you were never taught in schools? Why? The Vietnam War, nuclear bombs and nation building in Southeast Asia by author Mike Swanson with new documentation never seen before that will open your eyes to events that led up to this. Why? The Vietnam War, nuclear bombs in nation building in Southeast Asia, 1945 through 1961. Get your copy today at Amazon.com. Why? The Vietnam War by author Mike Swanson. The War State by Michael Swanson explains the great national transformation that took place and put the Kennedy presidency in the context of the times and reveals never before published information about the Cuban Missile Crisis. President Kennedy would not have been assassinated if he had been president 200 years ago. His assassination took place in the context of the Cold War and the rise of the national security state. Before World War II, the United States was a continental republic. In the decade that followed, it became an imperial superpower. Generals such as Curtis LeMay not only wanted to invade Cuba, but knew that there were short-range missiles on the island armed with nuclear warheads that they could not destroy because they were on mobile launchers. Their invasion could have led to a third world war, and they wanted to go to war anyway. The War State by Michael Swanson reveals why and will show you what President Kennedy was up against. For more information, thewarstate.com. Nuclear Holocaust. You know what uranium is, right? This thing called nuclear weapons and other things, like lots of... You know what uranium is, right? Bad things. Things are done with uranium, including some bad things. Nuclear Holocaust. You know what uranium is, right? I've been briefed. Nuclear Holocaust. Nuclear Holocaust. You know what uranium is, right? This thing called nuclear weapons and other things, like lots of... You know what uranium is, right? Bad things. Things are done with uranium, including some bad things. Nuclear Holocaust. Nuclear Holocaust. Nuclear Holocaust. Nuclear Holocaust. Nuclear Holocaust. Nuclear Holocaust. What are the dynamics of a crop? 
How do you move a mob? How do you excite them? How do you make them feel as one with you? I don't know how. Join them first. Join them? Yes. When you speak to them.